know this does not sound that I was working my while well, I was wake this afternoon. Or rolling my like. Oh, you are. <laughs> okay. All right, this is an interview at the Best Western Hotel, Delaware Avenue, Buffalo, New York. It is the 23rd of uh, February, 2006, approximately 4 p.m. Uh, the interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Frank Kubala. Uh, date of birth is 11 15 47. And I was born here in Buffalo, New York, but lived for the most part of my life in Rainsville, New York, just north of here. Okay. Uh, what was your educational background prior to entering service? Uh, I finished <coughs> high school, and I had completed one year of engineering school. I went to the University of Wisconsin and uh, tried to transfer uh, to a more local school and was caught up in the draft. And okay, so you were drafted? Yes, sir. All right. Um, when were you drafted? Uh, August 28, 1967. Okay, and drafted into the Army? Yes. Uh, where did you go for your induction and your basic training? Uh, my basic training was uh, out of Fort Dix, New Jersey. And then I went to Advanced Infantry School and then to Vietnam. Okay, um, how long was your training? The normal. Uh, what was it? Eight, eight weeks. Basic and then eight probably weeks. eight for AIT? About eight for AIT also. In retrospect, do you think you were prepared for what you encountered? In no, no, not at all. Why not? What, in what ways? It, it didn't compare. One day in Vietnam was, we learned more in one, our first day out than we learned in the whole uh, four or five months of training in, back in the United States. Mm -hmm. It was very inadequate, mm -hmm. I felt. Okay. Um, you flew into Vietnam? Yes. Were you assigned to a unit prior to going, or were you assigned there? I was assigned to the 9th Infantry Division, mm -hmm. uh, but not to any particular unit. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I landed in Vietnam the begin at the beginning of Tet, uh, I was kind of uh, left my own means for about three or four weeks before I actually was assigned to a unit. And... Um, just spend a lot of time doing nothing, waiting for them to get me there, because the units were so heavily involved at that time in the fighting. Mm -hmm. What was your impression when you first got off the plane? It was scary because it was Tet and mm -hmm. it was happening at mm -hmm. the airport. The uh, uh, in fact, they just let the the short ladder down from the plane, and everybody emptied out of the plane. We all had M16s and no bullets, and we were still dressed in our kind of travel uniforms and all that. And we were just let go to the four winds to find some place to be safe. And it, it was days before I, I got to, a, to where I was able to talk to somebody to find out where I should be and what I should be doing. And even then, it was, it was just total chaos. It was spooky. And as fast as they unloaded us off that plane, they closed that door and they took off. They did not refuel or nothing. They just took off. So and our baggage all went with, back on the plane with them. And so nobody, you know, we didn't have anything. Except for the clothes on our back, and like I said, a brand new M16 and no bullets. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you were trained on the M16 by, the, by your... Yeah. Your, yeah. Um, okay, where were you assigned? Where, if, okay, eventually. then eventually... The, eventually I was assigned with A Company, 3rd uh, Battalion, 47th Infantry Regiment. They were in the Mekong Delta, and uh, at that time they were part of the Mobile River Force, and it was a unique unit where uh, Army troops uh, lived on uh, troop ships. And we hit the beaches off of uh, landing craft every day. And, of course, we did a lot of uh, helicopter assaults and different other means, trucks we were transported in and uh, uh, tracks. And uh, I even got to ride on the hovercraft a couple times. Yeah. What, were some, <coughs> excuse me, what were some of your assignments as a riverine force? Uh, it was all search and destroy. Luckily, because it was so close after Tet, uh, our, we weren't ambushed as often as people in other units up in the Highlands and, mm -hmm. that we heard about. And even the guys that were there that survived Tet and had experienced, you know, the uh, normal search and destroy mission before it, they would say that, you know, there wouldn't be a day that they weren't always being uh, ambushed or something like that. Whereas we would get sniped mm -hmm. at once in a while. Mostly our problem, biggest problem, was booby traps. Yeah. Was it strictly uh, Viet Cong that uh, you were fighting, or were you fighting regulars also? Uh, tell you the truth, we didn't see the enemy. Mm -hmm. um, and when we, uh, you know, after 
we went a couple times. We were ambushed uh, in the, at night after we set up in a village or something like that. And if we did find a body, it was you couldn't tell if they were. They wouldn't be regular uniforms. They would be, generally be the black pajamas and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, we were on a sweep outside of Saigon uh, later on in May, and we captured a fellow, and he was huge. And what we found out through interrogations and all that afterwards that he was not. He was a uh, uh, Mongolian. Mm. But we we never heard any further. You know, they had people from the intelligence forces took him and took him away. But that's what we were told that he was Mongolian. Mm -hmm. Now, did you have the jungle fatigues at that point, or the no. stateside fatigues? Uh, well, yeah, yeah, they, they would be the jungle fatigues, but not camouflage or anything like that. Uh -huh. Just the lighter with the the diagonal pockets on okay. it, and the big baggy stuff. You know, sort of thing to wear. How did you like using the M1? Did you ever have any problems with it? M16, you mean? M16. Uh, I said, uh, when, when they gave it to me and I talked to some of the other guys, I said, no, thank you. And I volunteered to carry the M79. Oh. And I liked it better. Mm -hmm. uh, it never never misfired, never jammed. Uh, it was, you know, it was unreal because I used to carry as many rounds as I could in, with it. And so it got very, very heavy. Uh, but I got very proficient with it. and. Uh, Liked a lot better, especially when we we're in close quarters, you know, uh, the buckshot or something like that. Did you ever carry a sidearm at all? I was supposed to, but I was never issued one. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of other people who carried M79 used to carry a 45 or a 38. Mm -hmm. I did acquire a 38, but once the government, it was unofficial, and uh, once the, um, uh, the sergeant in charge of weapons found out that I had it, he took it away from me. Mm -hmm. Which I should have, uh, technically, I should have had it with me all the time, because once you're out of bullets, you're out of bullets. Okay, um, did you have uh, any much close contact with the people of the, the region? Yes, we did get to walk, through, because of search and destroy, we'd have to go from one location to another. It generally requires going through a village or something like that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we'd wait in villages and, and do different things there. Uh, went out a few times with our medics, uh, give them uh, security for when they were doing humanitarian type things, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, giving shots out or just checking the kids for diseases and the people around the village. Mm -hmm. So we did go in the village and uh, we had a Chuhoi with us, his name was Ba, and he was very likable and uh, we would, any village we'd go into, he would, he'd make friends right away with people and uh, we got a little feel for what, what the people were like and what their everyday lives. You know, they're mostly agrar agrarian uh, farmers and stuff like that and uh, they just wanted to go on with their lives, they didn't want to be involved with the war. Any problems with uh, tropical diseases or leeches or <laughs> malaria? Uh, all of the above. All of the above. Um, I, I, I am aquaphobic and I cannot stand being wet. But when you're in the Mekong Delta, I was yeah. wet even on dry days. Because uh, you'd have to walk across canals. I almost drowned a couple times. Uh, leeches just were uncommon. You found out who your real friends were because you'd have to drop your pants and everything and say, can you look back there and see these leeches? Your friends would tell you or take care of you. <laughs> the other guys would say, no, 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 about an hour later you feel something that's about the size of a snake on you. Uh, mosquitoes, I, I, I cannot stand mosquitoes to this day. Even if I put on all the blood repellent in the world, but just to hear them buzzing around my head drives me nuts. Um, we had bamboo vipers that were there. Just all kind of creepy crawly stuff. Uh, I had ringworm from my, my chest on down. I was taken out of the field quite often for that. Uh, um, and every other kind of known rash that you could have. We, we couldn't wear underwear because if you wore anything elastic around your waist, you, you get a horrendous rash you know, within hours. Uh, whenever we came back to base camp or to the ships, we, we would just walk around in shorts you know, on, just to dry out and to let our skin heal from from all the stuff, and a lot of times, uh, a lot of us were taken out of the field because of it. Mm -hmm. What were race relationships like within your unit? Race relationships. Yes, were there problems? Uh, or... We found. I tried to be. How should I say? I accepted everybody mm -hmm. until they gave, came to the point where they gave me problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as I got along after I made spec four, I, I was in for sergeant, so I was responsible for some guys. And what we found was most of the, guy, the black guys uh, were great guys. But as soon as they'd get about four or five of them, uh, they would start working together. The next thing you know, they weren't going on missions. They were complaining that they were always walking point. Uh, uh, 
Um, and I, I just said, hey guys, I do it too. I'm up there. I'm going there. You're going there. Um, that's, and that's how it was. You know? And uh, if they didn't want I said, fine. Go see the first sergeant. Work it out with him because I'm not, I can't do anything for you. Mm -hmm. I'm here. You're here. Let's get through it. Okay, now you were wounded twice. Did yes. You tell us about it. Uh, the first time was uh, uh, we were at the end of a mission, and uh, it was pretty quiet, and uh, there was no contact, and our first sergeant was with us for some reason that day in the field, which he shouldn't have been. And um, we, were, we were pulling security for the, uh, the boats to come in to take us away. And uh, as we were waiting there, uh, the radios were on, and somebody from one of the other units uh, came across the radio that a uh, Viet Cong had a shot at them and ran into the wood line. Well, we were in the woods. <laughs> Every place, you, it was jungle. And uh, the only thing that was behind us was the, was the canal, and the boats were coming in. And the first sergeant heard that the, the Viet Cong ran into the wood line, and he assumed that was the woods right in front of us. Well, he told us to all get on line to open fire. And a couple of us balked at him and says, you know, you, you can't open fire here because we don't know where the other Americans are coming in. Because they're all coming in to get on the boats. And he ordered us all to fire. So we fired. And when the firing stopped, and we heard bullets going both ways and all over the place. Uh, I was bleeding profusely from my ear and the back of my head. And what we uh, surmised was uh, either a grenade or something went off fairly close to me and grazed my, my ear and the back of my skull. And just missed my eyes, hit my glasses, and broke my glasses. And so I was medevaced out, and that was the first time I was wounded. And uh, there was quite a few of us that were wounded at, in that scenario. Uh, that were taken out of the field. Now, do you think it could have been friendly fire at all? It could have been. My one friend uh, laughs at me because he was uh, he claims he was standing next to me, and he was shooting his M79. And he says afterwards, I thought he, he got wounded. He got hit in the groin. And he said to me, he says, you know, I really shouldn't have been shooting the M79 because once it goes 10 feet, it's, li it's a live hangar day. And all it needs to do is hit a twig and it could explode. I said, yeah, right. maybe we shot it ourselves. Who knows? Uh, you know, because it just all hell broke loose once everybody opened up. Uh, it could have been our own guys at the, someplace in that, in mm -hmm. that thicket or whatever, too. Uh, we never found out. That was the other thing. We'd go out as a platoon or as a company and we'd do a sweep through an area. We know that this company's over here and that company's over there. But you don't know how far away they are from you at that given time. Because you're not, outside of radio, you're not really in contact with them. Mm -hmm. And you're, wor you're left with the discretion of what he sees and what he's telling you he is, as compared to where you are. And if you're in jungle, he could be 10 feet away from you, or 10 miles away from you. You didn't know. Mm -hmm. So it was very scary sometimes uh, in that scenario, if we would ever get uh, fired upon from a certain side. We'd be t in fact, there were a couple times where we were told we couldn't shoot that way. Because another platoon or another company was over there, uh -huh. and you know they play those games with us all the time. So, and then get on, you want to get on the second uh, purple yes. heart. Um, that was a scenario where we were for, uh, made to do a sweep around our base camp, and uh, in the sweep, uh, uh, a couple of the men got wounded slightly because of small small uh, booby traps. Uh, I figure what they call them, bouncing betties or something like that. They usually weren't too powerful. They weren't enough to kill you, but they were enough to just scratch you all up and make you bleed a lot. And uh, the, the doc, uh, the medic was with us, and he kept on complaining to this uh, sergeant or uh, the guy in charge, and that we should get these guys out of here because you know it was swampy, it was you know and they're going to get infected and all this stuff. And it's foolish just to go on a sweep because it's just around the, the out perimeter of our base camp. And finally, the they agreed to that we could bring medevac them out. And I was uh, acting sergeant at that time, and uh, I was familiar with the area because we had gone through it a couple months before. And I said, "No, there's a landing field about 100 yards up or so, and just a little further in." And so we we went to it, and uh, when we when we uh, were certain that the field was big enough for a chopper to come in, uh, I told the radio man to uh, call the chopper, tell him I'm going to pop a green smoke once I go out in the field, and just confirm that it's clear. So I went on the field, and I went through the, a brush pile to get to the, the open field. And the sergeant was with us. Uh, he was an E6. He, he said, I can't go through there. I said, well, you know, then don't come out here. And he said, well, there's a trail over here. I said, don't go that way. Either come the way I came, through the bush, or don't come out here at all. Well, I go out in the field, and I, I walked around the perimeter, and there was no, nothing there that I could see that would, you know, any, that 
not, nothing looked like an ambush or anything like that. And I yelled back to the radio guy, tell the chopper I got the green smoke because I could hear him in the sky. Uh-huh. And I'm standing there, I'm right, I pull the pin out, and all of a sudden I hear a metallic click. And I go, oh shit. I hit the ground. The sergeant came through the opening. He uh, chipped off a, they told me it was a landmine. It hit me and took up, you know, I almost lost my leg and, uh, and I found, I just found about a year ago the medic that did save me, that patched me up and got me, and we got in. But, uh, yeah, that was my last day. Now, was he killed? The medic told me he was killed, but now, I just talked to the medic about a month ago and I said to him, I says, Doc, you know, it was a little vague about that, that day. What do you remember and what can you talk about? He said, I don't mind talking about it. He claims that the, it wasn't a sergeant, E6. It was a, there was a major with us for some reason, and he uh, needed to go out in country and, and to get his combat infantryman's badge, and, um, and that's the one who got killed. But uh, I still, I'm trying to find out who it was because I can't, I have, I have a, a database, a website, mm-hmm. and I had the names of about 10,000 guys that went through the 9th Infantry Division, and I have the list of all, all the KIAs, and I know the dates. And either he didn't die that particular morning or that day, but I can't figure out who he is. Uh, and yeah, Maybe he wasn't even attached to the 9th Infantry Division, because that happened too. We had a lot of people, uh, forward observers going out with us. They weren't attached with the 9th. They were part of uh, uh, MACV or something like that, or uh, i or whatever. And... Um, so they wouldn't be wearing the 9th Infantry Division patch, but you know, after a while, you, you didn't pay attention if they had a patch on, because mm-hmm. half the time the uniforms didn't have patches on. So um, the story is still a little bit vague as to how you know who that person was that tripped that uh, landmine booby trap, whatever it was. Uh, but I know that I remember vaguely that when Doc came to me, I said, "How's the you know the other guy, whoever it was?" And I remember him telling me that he he he's gone. And Doc would not have came to me if, if the other guy was, you know, you know some pl- way of him taking care of him. And I remember there was a body bag in the chopper when they put me on, but by that time I was drifting in and out of consciousness. So. How do you think, can you comment on the medical treatment oh, you received? As far as from our, our, our me- medic or from the... All the way through. Uh, <laughs> well, once we got to Vietnam, it was great. Uh, it was hard getting to it because they wanted you to be out in the field all the time. So uh, unless you really screamed and yelled and kicked a lot, you know, you didn't go. Uh, if you had a hangnail or something, they, you know, they couldn't get through it. First average was always your first line of defense. You had to get through him to get to go see a medic, even if it was serious. Uh, with the um, uh, ringworm and uh, the rashes and all that, they were pretty good. Uh, we could get to them and. Uh, in most of the cases, we would go see uh, Navy corpsmen because I lived on a Navy troop ship. Mm-hmm. So they were they were really great, you know. And uh, they would give you uh, you know downtime. Of course, the first hour you always find you something to do. You know, do something, keep busy. But um, they, they, I was very well treated. Uh, then when I was wounded, every time I was I was taken care of, I thought very well. I uh, spent a lot of time. I spent. Uh, Let's see, about a week in, in uh, dog time in, in the hospital, we got wounded, and then I spent about two or three weeks in Saigon, almost a month in, in Tokyo, and then uh, about four or five months in Walter Reed, uh, you know, having some minor surgeries done and a lot of physical therapy. Yeah, so uh, that was okay. But then I still had time left in the Army. They wouldn't give me a medical discharge, uh, so I had to finish up my tour of duty with the... Uh, Second Armor Division went down to Fort Polk, uh, no Fort Hood, Texas. I'm sorry, and uh, luckily I knew I had type, so I became company clerk. How long were you down there for? Uh, I was supposed to be there for almost five months, but because my father owned a farm and uh, there was certain things on the books that if you could foresee to labor or college, you can you can get out of the army 90 mm-hmm. days early. I applied for it, so I qualified, so I got out three months earlier than I was supposed to. It was getting to be a little rough because I couldn't do anything. Uh, you know, being an infantry soldier, being attached to an armored division, that meant going out in the field, running around, and jumping up and down. I wasn't physically capable of doing it. Uh, but luckily, like I said, uh, I did get the thirty, uh, the ninety day early out, which you know helped me re- recover from all that. Because uh, I think I could not have taken another ninety days of it. It was getting really rough on me. I still, really wasn't in very good shape. Not what they wanted me to mm-hmm. do. So, 
Do you ever suffer from post stress or anything? Yeah, like yeah. I, I mostly suffer from nightmares. And Joyce, uh, I am uh, being compensated enough. I got a percentage. Of me. But most of mine are just um, bad nightmares. I almost drowned a couple times uh, when I was over there. And just uh, certain things bring it on to me, you know. Uh, nightmares about mice and rats, stuff like that. But uh, I think uh, there was only one time when I had a flashback. It was we were in, uh, in France in 1976, and we were traveling around the countryside in uh, on a tour bus. We went through this one town in France, and all of a sudden, you know, I just kind of had weird feelings and um, just kind of it was very strange. And afterwards, I was talking with the uh, tour guide, and she said to me, "She says, were you in Vietnam?" I go, "Yes." And she said, because she had observed that I was something was wrong with me. And I said, why? She goes, well, Vietnam was a colony of France. And probably what it was, was that architecture in that village was very unique. And it's probably what you saw in Vietnam and then it came back to you. I said, oh, yeah, that was it. So I, that's, that's about everything. I, I don't have any violent tendencies or uh, hallucinations or, you know, I'm going to jump out of windows or nothing like that, you know. I, I live a, I live a very good life and I enjoy my life and um, I just go out it uh, I've had experience and met people who suffer from post traumatic stress and uh, they they frighten me <laughs> they frighten me big time uh, but I feel sorry for them you know. but, How do you feel about the rules of engagement? What rules of engagement? Restrictions that were put on some of the units. Oh gosh. We were in no fire zones mm -hmm. where we, we were told not to put a bullet in the gun. Right. Of course, our comment was, if you want to come out there and ensure that we don't have a bullet in the gun, then we won't put a bullet in the gun. But you're welcome to come out with us and tell us that out in the field. Mm -hmm. uh, no way in hell. We were locked and loaded every time. Mm -hmm. And if we felt we were in danger or we had been shot at, we returned fire. That, that was the dumbest thing I ever heard of in my whole life. Go to war and not put a bullet in your gun. Mm -hmm. And walk around out there in the broad day. You know, they're hiding and you're in the open fields or in the jungle. And they're going to shoot at you. And you got to then try to get the bullet out of your, wherever you got it and put it in your gun. No way. The bullet was in the gun. Now when you came back to the States, you came through the medical area. Yeah. Um, were you aware of uh, protesters in the anti-war movement? Oh, yeah. How did you feel about it? It was awakening. Um, my first thing was I landed at Andrews Air Force Base in, in Washington, D.C. And it was a hot August day. And they put us into like an old school bus. And I noticed that the windows had chicken wire over them and steel bar. And they're all up. And there was no air conditioning. And I said to the people, I was still unable to, unable to walk. I said to them, I said, how do you open these windows? They go, no, you don't want to open the windows. I go, what? You'll find out. Well, when we were all loaded up, and they closed the doors, and we had a, an escort. Sirens going, and the military police and all that. And we went flying through the front gate, and as we went through the front gate, the bus was palmated with every kind of rotten fruit and excrement you can think of. And all the protesters were out there. And I had a couple experiences while traveling, because I had to travel. I was lucky, because I think I came home three or four times when I was at Walter Reed. And every time I came through Buffalo, and of course at that time you had to wear your uniform when you flew. And a couple times coming through Buffalo or uh, Dallas Airport, I was approached. And, uh, yeah, it was just ugly. Uh, you know, I have no protester, I have no sympathy for, and <laughs> I'm glad I don't experience fi running into them now. How do you, how do you feel... Uh about Jane Fonda's uh, and and her confession. She's a joke. She's a joke. Oh, the confession? Uh, yes. I, Go to hell. Okay. <laughs> Bottom line. And I'll help you get there. Would you uh, think you would ever want to go back to visit Vietnam? <sighs> Probably not. Probably not. Uh, the There's smell. Several veterans we've interviewed that have gone back. And I know a lot of guys have gone back, and other people who weren't even there, but had parents or, or I mean, fathers or something else. Or uh, I belong, I'm a, I'm on the board of directors for the Mobile Marine Force, which is a, a unit uh, 
for both Army and Navy guys. And almost every year they have raffles for tickets to go back, you know, all expenses paid. And I go, I wouldn't, I'll give you the money for the raffle, but I don't want it <laughs> to help the organization. You know, here's, here's a donation. Don't give me a ticket. Um, I think it would bring back too many bad memories. Um, the, sm the smell would be the one thing, first off. Growing up in a farm, I thought I always smelled everything, but man, when I got there, whew. Uh, that's, so that's the one thing a lot of veterans who went to Vietnam, they said as soon as they got off the plane, yep. the smells, and but you, of course, got off under fire, too. Yeah. So. yeah. Um, did you use the GI Bill at all? Oh, yeah. yeah. I went back to college, and I uh, got an associate's degree, and I did some, uh, eventually I got a, ma a bachelor's degree. And also, I learned under um, that the GI Bill could be used a lot for a lot of other things, not only for college education, but when I, I was working as a computer engineer for Burroughs, uh, we were constantly under being trained and sent to school. And of course, the, comp the corporation paid for it. But what I was able to uh, work out with New York State Department of Labor and the VA was that since it was a regimented program and there were guidelines and uh, you had to pass courses and stuff like that. Uh, I was able to, not only for myself, but all the other guys who were working with me, that we got all our GI Bills. Uh, we got all the money. If we had, you know, a year or two years, whatever, left over, everybody got it. And uh, my boss took that to the corporation, which was Burroughs Corporation, and submitted it to him. And a lot of guys all over the United States got to use their GI Bill because of the plan that I laid down for them. And uh, that was pretty uh, gratifying for me that I... You know, I did the little effort. Nobody else thought about it. I just said, well, what the heck? It's like school, you know, and it worked. You know, we got, uh, all we need is people sit down, sign some paperwork, lay out a plan, and it was it was a done deal. And that was pretty nice when, you, you know, Burroughs did not pay a lot back in the 70s. But it was nice to get, you know, 100, 200 bucks or whatever. Especially a lot of these guys were, were family guys with kids. And if you had a, uh, you were married and you had a couple kids, you know, you were talking four or $500 in some cases. So it it really benefited a lot of people. Did you uh, join any veterans organizations? Oh yeah, let's see which ones. <laughs> I'm a life member of EVA Chapter 77. I'm a life member of the American Legion. I'm a life member of the Military Order of the Purple Heart. I'm on the board of directors for the uh, Mobile Riverine Force. Um, is there any you didn't join? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> well, that, there's there's a little reason for that, too. Uh, I, I, about four years ago, I started, uh, I was looking for a new business to start. I was, after I uh, finished working for 15 years for Burroughs Corporation, and the bottom fell out back in the 80s, mm -hmm. uh, couldn't find a job as an engineer. Uh, nobody wanted to hire me, at least in this area. So I started my own business. I started, I was a photographer, a sports photographer. I was doing very well. And about two or three years ago, I had some health issues coming down, and, and it was just getting too much, just running around all the time. I, I started a business where I sell military challenge coins. So that was the reason why I joined, well, I, I well, actually, I was, by that time, I was already a life member of some of the organizations. But uh, it's a w avenue for me to help sell my coins, mm -hmm. and doing very well. Most of them I'm selling on Z eBay. Uh, I would go to meetings and that, that would be, you know, worthwhile sometimes, but it was a lot of nights again and a lot of traveling and drinking beers with guys, and I, I need to cut back on the drink of the beers. So uh, I saw on eBay. So, But there was a method in my madness to join all, all, the, all the different organizations. But I, I still communicate with them, and, and it, it, uh, you know, it was rewarding, too. Now, do you design the coins, or they all, no, are they I, all uh, I buy coins that have already been pre-designed. Uh -huh. uh, I have designed a couple coins for myself, and I uh, helped... Uh, um, the fellow who owns the company that I buy most of my coins from, he actually was technically, we kid each other, that he was my replacement in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. He was in, in my company and everything, but he came about uh, four or five months later. And he did his tour, and then he uh, came, uh, he has a very interesting story about how he came back, went to college, uh, got uh, had to join ROTC to, in order to afford college because his father had passed away. And then after he got out, they said, well, why don't you stay in? we we'll give you a captain's bars and all that. And he says, well, that's not good enough. They said, we'll give you anything you want, because he was infantry, you know. And he says, I want special forces, scuba, and this other, a couple other things. And they go, no problem. Well, he just retired two years ago as a, as a colonel from uh, special forces. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's the owner of the company, and 
he's the one that got me started in the business and uh, we, we designed a lot of coins between us, you know, him and I. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he'll send a design to me, he says, what do you think of this? And I'll tell him this or that. And he says, okay, yeah, I can, I can see that. And, okay, no, that's the way I want to do it that way. Okay. But at least I, and I, I'm more, uh, when I went back to college, I, I got a degree in uh, uh, graphic arts, you know, in arts and computer science. And so, and being a photographer, I, I have a, a, an eye for detail, an eye for what makes things look right. Mm -hmm. And so he's, he appreciates that when I give him back my input as to what I see when I'm looking at some things. So uh, it works out very well for us. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone that you served with that uh, you stayed in contact with? Well, uh, about eight years ago, my daughter was uh, at RIT and she was uh, taking a course in, in journalism. And she needed to interview somebody. And about up to that time in my life, if I didn't need to tell you that I was in Vietnam, I didn't tell you. In fact, we had some friends that almost to this day still can't believe that I was really there. I sometimes wonder if I was really there. But my daughter interviewed me and she, she brought me home. And uh, about that time, one of the things I realized is that I had a lot of, a lot of good buddies. And uh, I wanted to see them again. And I started a website. That's where the over 10,000 names are now. Mm -hmm. And I've since that time helped a lot of other guys too find their buddies because of the information I've gathered that I pass on to them. I have hundreds of stories of people I've helped. And in the course of helping other guys, I've been trying to find all of my people. I think we have maybe uh, two or three more guys from our platoon that we haven't found yet. We're getting it narrowed down. And the last guy I found, actually I found two of my best buddies the medic that saved me, because he really patched me up pretty good, you know, and stopped the bleeding and all that. And then another guy, his name was Robert, whose name is Robert Sigmund, and I found both of them on the same day, uh, about what three, four months ago. I think it was in October. October, yeah. something like that. So, and that's very rewarding. So. Mm -hmm. okay. um, what's the other question? Do you ever read much on Vietnam? I've read two or three books about Vietnam. Uh, most of them I bought when I was at the, one of my ruins or wh whatever. Um, one was written by a chaplain who was with the 9th Division. Division. Uh, but he, uh, in reading his book, uh, I felt sad because uh, he told a lot of great things, but he was very fixated on people dying. He wanted, to, whenever he talked about somebody dying, he, he would go into such detail, and I felt it wasn't necessary. And he would go on, he would, mm -hmm. like a whole chapter, you know, would be just kind of all on this one person and about this whole scenario. And, mm -hmm. and I kind of, after a while, I felt that this was his, um, how should I say, his method of recovering or, or accepting what he had experienced mm -hmm. in. You know, he was out in the field too. He, he wasn't a chaplain that just sat in the back. Um, there was another one by a guy who was uh, an infantry soldier and then volunteered to go back as a uh, in the bubble helicopters. He was like an observer type person. I can't exactly remember the whole detail. His book was kind of interesting, and his was more on the lighter side. He talked about ambushes and different things, but he didn't get into the, the gory details of you know people getting killed. Um, I've tried to pick up a couple of the books and just. Didn't how about any of the movies? Uh, when I can tolerate them, uh, they're a joke. Mm -hmm. um, we keep saying that Apocalypse Now is was a uh, uh, how should I say a uh, Hollywood's interpretation of what we in the Mobile Riverine Force really did, which we didn't go into battle with Ray Stereo's blasting and some guy wearing a. a a Stetson or a surfboarding, be, yeah, oh, okay. surfboarding behind a PT boat because you couldn't do that. They wouldn't go that fast. Um, well, and the other story is, is kind of a joke for us because Forrest Gump was in the 9th Infantry Division, 2nd of the 42nd, mm -hmm. 47th, which is uh, kind of a, a wrong because the 2nd of the 47th was a mechanized office and the 3rd and 4th of the 42nd were the straight leg outfits. And there's stories floating around about that we really know who Forrest Gump was and that, you know, the names have changed and all that. And I understand, uh, the guy came to one of our reunions prior to when I started going to him and talked about it and this and that. Uh, um, the Michael Jackson movie, I can't remember the name of it. Um, 
Jackson. Not Michael Jackson. Uh, Michael, Michael, J. Michael J. Fox. Fox. Yeah, wrong, wrong Michael. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How'd they get him? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, this, I screwed up with that. <laughs> uh, Michael J. Fox. I, I thought that was very realistic, and I, I think there was probably a lot of issues like that where you know, somebody went over the line and did something, and then they tried to cover it up, and that somebody was a whistleblower, and, you know, uh, I don't know. I really haven't watched the whole movie. I, I don't know if it was considered a protest-type Hollywood movie or if it was maybe, or could be used in that light, because, they, you know, they always are saying to us, oh, you're baby killers, you kill all these other than... No, 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 no. You know, and uh, that might be give fire to those, that uh, group of people. The one, uh, what, uh, there was a Marine one, Full metal jacket. Full metal jacket. Yeah, I really haven't got into that one, but that mm -hmm. uh, that one seemed like a little bit too much. Um, there was another one with. Uh, they were the twenty fifth infantry division. But that that one got in like uh, people got fragged and they were smoking pot all the time. We, were you aware of drugs at all while you no. were there? No. No, and our unit was very tight. Well, if we had a suspicion that somebody was into something, mm -hmm. they had an accident. Mm -hmm. Not bad, mm -hmm. you know, nothing serious, but they weren't going out in the jungle with me mm -hmm. or us. Mm -hmm. uh, we wanted everybody to stay. Uh, no. We drank crazy when we went back at, you know, we were back in base camp, we, you know, beer parties and all that stuff, but when you were going back out, you were sober as a judge and there was no fooling around. How do you think your time in the service changed or had an effect on your life? Oh, a great effect. Um, see things totally in a different light. Um, some of them sad. Some of them good times. Mm -hmm. um, it was hard when my son came to us and told us he wanted to go in the Marine Corps. But it was his decision at that point in time. And I told him, I says, if it would have been my decision to go into service when it was in Vietnam, I says, I would not have gone. Mm -hmm. I would not have volunteered for nothing. I had to go. I had no choice. Somebody else decided for me. Mm -hmm. um, would I do it again? Probably not. Probably not. Even if I knew I would walk out without a scratch. Not what I saw, not what I had to put up with. Not, a, not, a, not in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your interview. Okay.